This is St. Laurent Nuclear Power Station. It currently operates two pressurized water reactors, named B1 and B2, providing vital power to the region of central France. However, today we're not looking at the setup dating back to the 80s, but the site's predecessor power units, rather predictably named A1 and A2, and sited here. Today they are out of use but each one would be the stage for two of France's worst nuclear reactor meltdowns. Rather neatly, each ranking a four on the INES scale. You're in luck today, as we are looking at both incidents. Welcome to Plainly Difficult, and today we're going to have a little bit of a dive into the St. Laurent meltdowns of 1969 and 1980. This video wouldn't have been possible if it wasn't for my Patreon, YouTube and Ko-fi members. If you want to support the channel financially, then you can from just £1 per month. And as always, the links will be in the pinned comment below. As well as links to other bits and pieces I have up for sale. As well as the music and other random bits and pieces that I get up to when I'm not making YouTube videos. Nuclear power in central France. Before we begin, I've just got to say that this video has been on my list for years. I actually started writing this script in 2023, but never really got around to finishing it. I don't really know why, but we are where we are. Our story will begin at the beginning of the power station at Saint Laurent. France was rather eager to get in on the nuclear power right from the 1950s beginning with the first building work at the country's first nuclear power station in 1952, called the Mercure nuclear site. Don't worry, I won't go too much deeper into the French nuclear programme, apart from in the mid-1950s, France decided to up its nuclear game in the face of the increasing east-west tensions of the Cold War. The country, as I mentioned before, commissioned its first nuclear reactor type in 1952. The country commissioned its first nuclear reactor type, the Uranium Natural Graphite Gas, in 1956. This would be the same overall design involved in our little disasters later on. Before Saint Laurent, France would build two power plants, the aforementioned Marcoule and the Chinon nuclear power plant. The Saint Laurent plant would be sited along the Lyon River and was set to be home for two UNGG reactors. So how did this spicy machine work? Well, the design was of a gas called graphite moderated reactor. It was fueled with natural uranium, constructed as fuel elements clad with an aluminium zirconium alloy. The fuel was mounted inside the graphite moderator via roughly 3000 vertical chambers. So the way the reactor generated power was from heating up its carbon dioxide coolant by the reactor's chain reaction. The coolant is pumped through the core and then into a heat exchanger where water is heated upon up in a separate circuit. Once heated the water turns into steam and then turns turbines which then in turn turns generators and bing bada boom you've got your blackout breakfast avoiding lecky. Basically like everything it's all down to boiling water to turn a turbine. Like nearly all reactors, they are equipped with control rods. These absorb the reaction's neutrons, reducing the power. They can also be used to shut down the reactor when needed. Gas-cooled reactors can run at much higher temperatures than other designs, allowing for better efficiency, but at a cost. Which is, well, its cost. They pose a much more money-intensive investment, which would ultimately be their downfall. But we don't need to worry about that yet in this point of the video. The reactor was placed inside a steel vessel, then inside a concrete structure. The reactor was placed above the steam generation section, creating a tall but compact structure. The type of reactor was very similar to the Magnox over here in the UK. It also had the ability to produce weapons grade uranium. So that's my explanation of the reactors. Don't forget I am just a disembodied voice on the Bernus Lee sphere. Anywho, work on the St. Laurent site began in 1963, with reactor A1 going online on the 24th of March 1969, with A2 construction beginning in 1966 and being completed in 1971. 
The site was operated by EDF. And as a side note, they supply my electricity here in South London as well. Right, so that's about a rough explanation of the reactors. Let's go on to our first meltdown at Saint Laurent. 1969. It is the 17th of October 1969, and Saint Laurent A1 had been online for just a few months. Post its 24th of March 1969 startup, and part of its regulation and optimization period, the reactor was subjected to loads of different experiments and tests. As such, fuel channel loadings were different from normal operation configurations. The tests were done via hot test channels, basically an unfuel loaded channel through the reactor core. This could allow for experimental fuel and control rods to be tested without having to shut the reactor down. The hot test and fuel channels were serviced by the big old main handling device. However, it had proven to be rather unreliable, logging hundreds of issues over just a few months between the opening and October. The handling device's control system worked off punch cards. However, it would be found that there had been an address error during the reprinting of a card sometime between the 8th and 16th of October. The hot test channel was being used to test the loading of defueled fuel graphite logs. The error-laden punch card was loaded and the main handling device went into action, loading the graphite logs. However, it was not loaded into the hot test chamber. Instead, an active fuel-containing channel received the graphite log. Operators didn't notice the error and in an effort to save time, didn't do a flow test on the hot channel, which also might have highlighted the error. Almost as soon as the loading of the fuel channel with the extra material was complete, the temperature in the channel started soaring. What was happening was that the addition of graphite had caused a reduced flow of coolant gas to the channel. In a matter of seconds, the fuel's aluminium zirconium alloy cladding began to melt. At 7.05 in the morning, the fuel, some nearly 50 kilograms of uranium, had melted. The reactor was shut down and it would be out of action for quite a while. The fuel that melted was luckily fairly newly inserted, meaning it wasn't heavily irradiated, but it would still be a big mess to clean up. Clean up was done by remote controlled equipment, however extra work via human intervention had to be also employed. Workers exposure time was limited to just 10 minutes per session. The reactor finally went back online nearly a year to the day on the 16th of October 1970 costing France's nuclear industry millions of francs. The incident was played down to the French public, with officials instead playing up the quick and efficient cleanup and restarting of A1. But another melting for spicy material would blight the big power plant just over a decade later. 1980 It is the 13th of March 1980. And on the face of the newer of the two gas-cooled reactors at Saint Laurent, named A2, everything seemed to be running as normal. At around 5pm, loading was underway of two of the reactor core's channels. Reactivity around the reactor vessel unexpectedly and dramatically rose. Just over 10 minutes later, the cladding rupture detection system triggered a shutdown. The control rods were dropped into the core, stopping the reactor. Operators were unsure of what the issue was, but due to the reactivity in the core, the first inspections could only be undertaken on the next day. During this check, the reactor had to be depressurized. A significant amount of uranium was thus then assumed to have melted. Further analysis of the reactor would take place the following week. It was found that around 20 kilograms of uranium had melted and fallen to the bottom of one of the fuel channels. On the 27th of March, an inspection discovered that a metal sheet from a monitoring device had broken loose due to corrosion and had then blocked cooling to six channels in the reactor core. The meltdown would affect the reactor much more than what happened at A1, where the reactor would be shut down for over three years. The repair and clean-up works began in June 1980, again making use of remote-controlled equipment and, like before, requiring human intervention, involving nearly two years of radioactive dust collection and disposal. It was estimated that during the cleanup, 29.6 terabecules of rare gases and 0.37 terabecules of iodine were released into the environment. 
This time, however, it wasn't really operator error, but a sign of the general poor management of the site. Reportedly, warnings were ignored that corrosion was present in the reactor vessel, most notably from an inspection in January 1980. Again, the event was played down, and after the cleanup of A2, the reactor was pressed back into service. But the lifetime of domestically produced gas called reactors of France was nearing the end. The UNGG reactors across the country would be shut down in the following decade, in favour for light water designs. This was rather the case at St. Laurent, with A1 and A2 being shut down in the early 90s in favour for the much newer and more modern B1 and B2, which still operate on site to this day. But even though shut down, St. Laurent's gas-cooled reactors would cause a media stir when a documentary was released in 2015. The aftermath. So this 2015 documentary, named Nuclear, The Politics of Lying, would posit that after the 1980 meltdown, EDF had released reactive material into the Lior River for five years after the accident. In response to the documentary, the then at the time of the release, head of EDF Marcel Baito gave a rather humorous statement regarding the incident. It's still not much, it's not good, but it doesn't matter. If this was done, it was with the approval of the public authorities. We could not have done otherwise. Sediment samples along the river found traces of plutonium, which could only have come from the St. Laurent nuclear reactors, although the levels were below a discernible health concern. An investigation and subsequent complaint without further action was filed against EDF in 2016. Both major incidents at St. Laurent would go in the 1990s on the INES scale at a level of 4, which puts it on the same rating as incidents such as the Tokimura incident, which I've also done on a video, which will be linked around here. So that's my video on the St. Laurent reactor meltdowns. Hopefully I haven't angered EDF too much to shut off my electricity. So it's scale time. It's going to only really be a 1 or maybe a 2. And this is what I've got for my root cause analysis card. Do you agree? Let me know in the comments below. This is a Plain Default production. All videos on the channel are Creative Commons attribution share like license. Plain Default videos produced by me, John, in the currently quite moderate corner of Southern London, UK. And all I have to say is thank you very much for watching and Mr. Music, play us out please.